operating as the technical producer today in addition to everything else. Just perfect. Let me make sure, confirm that we are recording. We are. It is the final show on the entire network of 2023. It is the grid. It's December 29th, 2023. Chaz Smith, welcome back. So good to be here, David Lee Scales. Days away from 2024, if you can imagine. And enjoying the surf, despite being in our home studios, by watching today, but I guess the crew like at Couch hey guys, Surfing. I mean, seriously. This is Seal Beach right now. That's where they went up to. Okay, I was trying to figure out where they went up to. I mean, so the swell obviously is pumping in California right now. Uh, I got a notification from Couch Surfing that they were going live, and I pull it up. They're at Seal Beach. Southside Shore Break, which was a secret spot up until last year when Kelly Slater went there yep. um, to talk about turtles and then uh, blew up the spot. And now couch surfing's there, given the full rundown with the Lokes on how it came to be, the history, the people. And it's kind of epic to see, to be honest. I mean, those guys live show, uh, those guys in general, Joe Alani and the boys are great, but their live streams are something truly to behold. I love, I mean, I just feel like if you can't be there in person, this is the next best thing. And they do such a good job of creating the context and, and by the way, catching all the action, you know, like panning away and showing the beach when there's no action, but being right on top of it once sets start pouring through. So good. They should hire those boys for the World Surf League booth. They should just go on tour and shoot all the free surf footage around the events even, you know, I feel like there's a business to be had there. I mean, so true. Yeah. But this speaking of the super swell, did you paddle out into it? I got, I surfed here yesterday at a spot that will remain nameless, but nice. um, it wasn't as, I mean, it was that spot requires it to be big to uh, even break really, but it wasn't as chaotic as all the footage that you're seeing. It's um, tempered a lot because of the angle and some other stuff going on, but I absolutely, conditions were flawless throughout mid half the day, at least. Yeah, it was absolutely, I went out, what is today? Today is Friday. I went out Wednesday and you could just really feel the swell building. Mm. Uh, yeah. And then yesterday got too busy, but was watching it all day long. It was watching people get cleaned up uh, by, by rogue sets on Circline is an enjoyable pastime. <laughs> the, um, it, I mean, I don't know if pe people died or not, but I saw footage from Ventura at least where people, there was eight people that got injured just by a rogue wave. It's unbelievable the amount of hubris. Not even, It's not even hubris. It's just complete ignorance, I guess, yeah. that ignorance. people have that are standing there literally like on the shoreline and they just get cleaned up. Like they have no awareness that a tidal wave or a rogue wave can come and blow everything out. I, I mean, I will say, ocean, like I've been privileged and blessed to have grown up on the beach, like an organ too. Like, you know, yeah, you kind of know what's going on. You know when to get close, you know when to stay far away. But there, you know, there's places like Shore Acres and stuff where these huge waves just blow up into the rocks. And there would always be tourists getting over the fencing and like going out onto the edge of slippery rocks uh, and somewhat regularly like falling in. It's insane. I mean, now it's influencers that are doing it strictly to get the shot. You know, yep. they want to see an explosion like Little Mermaid or something. Good for them. Good for the influencers. Keep on lemmings into the ocean. Um, well, the thing about so hearing the Lokes talk about Seal Southside Seal Beach, which I would be apprehensive to name if they weren't live Never. broadcasting <laughs> a show. Um, but basically what they said about that and putting it on blast is Southside Seal takes care of itself. Like that wave is so expert level that there's no chance of you paddling into a set wave unless you 100% know what, I mean, you have to be a top level pro basically to do it. I mean, watching, it is like a pretty much at this swell direction and this swell size, a gaping barrel breaking right on the sand. Yeah. And the other thing is when you're, some barreling waves, you can surf where you can backdoor the thing where you get like an easy entry on the left and then you just position and head right and back door it and come out and there isn't that much critical kind of takeoff this there isn't really that option it's You're, just it's a like crazy it, critical drop yeah it looks like pipeline-esque not to 
beat that dead horse but like the way you have to take off basically under the lid yeah uh is yeah rincon yesterday was fully maxed out bigger than i've ever seen it um mavericks was probably the biggest i've ever seen it was tow only nobody was even paddling it at mavericks did you read about the rogue jet ski in the lineup at mavericks i, I saw ashton's article on stab i didn't know he was still Ooh. writing for stab <laughs> where did you read home, about it from his home break of san francisco ashton is the man where everywhere's home did you write an article too uh derek did <clears throat> what's this what was the story behind it i don't know i just saw the rogue jet ski in the lineup of mavericks and thought that's not good no it looked like the footage i saw somebody got bucked off and i just I, I didn't even see the bucking i just saw the rogue jet ski almost like must have got bucked off like near the peak because the thing was kind of surfing almost a wave and then off onto the shoulder of the wave do uh when a jet ski goes rogue do you other jet ski riders have to like yeehaw like is it a rodeo out there where they all like take off and try to lasso the thing they were, they were chasing it down. I don't know what the plan would be at that point <laughs> because there's the little uh, key, right? That yeah. should be attached to the driver. And once that pops out, it kills yeah. the ski. That yeah. one was still going. Yes. And so it was like cruising around. And so, but I mean, imagine the fun if you're a ski driver out there, obviously you got to protect the boys first, but to play rodeo in the lineup at Mavericks would be kind of fun. That, I mean, that would be the ultimate job in surfing rodeo yeah. clown. Yeah. <laughs> um, you'd have to lasso the key would be the goal is like yeah. you're trying to land a little hook on that thing and pull the key out. The great thing in surfing, though, is we have lassos. We use lassos every day. We call them leashes, but they have a lasso out there ready to go. That is a good point. Yep. Double duty for that thing. Yep. Uh, how was Christmas? It was great. It was a low key affair here at the Smith Wallace household. It was yeah, what did we even do? We opened gifts. Oh, I'll tell you what we did. We went out to the best restaurant on earth for dinner. I think I told you that. Red Tracton. Have you ever been to Red Tracton? We've talked about Red Tracton. We had conversations about Red Tracton surrounding the boardroom show. Yes, Red Tracton. We went to a Christmas Eve or Christmas night dinner. Perfect. Okay, Five cool. What a martinis. Beautiful. I yeah. batched. So, dude, I batched martinis this year before Christmas. Wow. That is the move. Was everybody hammered? The few of us that were partaking, actually, no. I think everybody got hammered the night before. Okay. Uh, ev yeah, most people, uh, not myself, but the other people that were in attendance on Christmas were feeling the effects, so they took it easy. Uh, two is the limit when it comes to a martini, basically. No, no, like, yeah, the other couple of Christmases back, we were hosting, and I can't remember who, but said oh, you know, martini should be the cocktail. And I was like, sweet, without not thinking that you're just dumping straight alcohol down people's throats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people were messy quick. Well, I've decided that it is the perfect cocktail. It's the original cocktail. It's the perfect cocktail. And now I am on a quest to perfect the exact right gin with the exact right vermouth because you can buy the most expensive version of both, but that doesn't really right. net the best martini. I mean, that's the thing about cocktails, right? I think people get confused sometimes that uh, a the best cocktail requires the best version of that alcohol. And oftentimes it doesn't. A whole The whole point of a cocktail is this mixed flavor. And so if you're into drinking your spirits neat, obviously, it's important to have the best quality, but not always for a, yeah, a mixed drink. Yeah, you do want good quality still, but there's a million different varieties of gin, of course, and there's $25 options or $70 options, and the $70 one doesn't net a better martini. It's the exact combination between a certain type of flavor of a gin with a certain type of flavor of the vermouth, and uh, I haven't nailed it, but the ones that I batched for Christmas, just put them in a one gallon or one liter water bottle, basically, threw it in the freezer for 24 hours, brought it with me to the party, and it was just ready to go. No yeah. mixing required at that point. And uh, those ones weren't perfect, but they were really, really, really good. Where were you? Let me guess. You were Tanqueray and uh, what was your vermouth? Your vermouth was, shoot, that one. I don't know vermouths by name, and I couldn't even tell you the one I used. Um but the gin that I found that I really like for martinis is Ford's. Ford's? Ford's. It's a British gin, and it's 25 bucks for a 75-milliliter bottle. It's not that expensive. 
Um, but I traditionally drink Hendrix. Okay. But this was the Fords I'm on to, and I just got to find the perfect vermouth to pair with it. Well, that's great. But what I like about it, why it is the perfect cocktail is it's clean. There's no, obviously, sugar involved. You do get, you definitely feel it after one. You definitely feel it after two, but it cleans up. Like, I don't feel it for an extended period of time, and I don't feel a hangover from it. And the, and it really does regulate, like macking Southside Seal Beach. Uh, it does regulate on its own. Like It does. If you go, if you want to be messy and go three or four martinis, then you are going to pay for that, right? There is no totally. skirking out. Like it is the drink, the cocktail where two is not only ideal, two is the limit. But it puts you on notice. Like yeah. you drink one and you feel it instantly. Whereas yeah. tequila, I feel like sometimes- It's a sneaker set. And it tells, it makes you think you should have more. Yeah, yep. The, mar no, the yeah. martini, it's like, it puts You've you on notice. Enough. One, it goes, hey buddy, do yep. you want to do two? <laughs> and then you go, I think, I, you know, sometimes you do. I don't always, but sometimes on Christmas you do. And then at the end of two, you're like, I don't I've need any more. Yep. I'm totally good. I want to be okay tomorrow. I want to be yep. okay later tonight. And it, and the, the other thing is the, uh, I, I guess you would call it. It's still lucid. Like I yeah. don't feel sloppy. I'm not, you know, saying things that I'm going to regret tomorrow. It's, it's like, it is the perfect cocktail, at least for my body's chemistry. Do you feel that the vodka martini is an affront to martini dumb in general? You know, I don't feel like it's an affront. It just needs to be labeled as such. Like you yeah. can't call it a martini. You have to call it a vodka martini yeah. in the same way that you would call Chicago pizza, deep dish pizza or Chicago pizza. You don't just call that pizza or yeah. flatbread. You can't call pizza. You got to call it a flatbread pizza. You know, it's true. It's yeah. true. A vodka martini. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, awesome. Did you get any cool Christmas gifts? I did. I got a great stocking cap. Uh, and what do you, do you call them stocking caps, beanies? I, uh, I never called it a stocking cap. And even when you said it, my brain, my brain went through a Rolodex of what could that possibly mean? I was envisioning Scrooge with like the one that he goes to sleep <laughs> with, with a ball at the end of it. A toque. You can call them a toque if you want. Okay. That's what they call them in Canada. Uh, yeah, that's what I got. What did you get? Got a brisket knife. Nice. <laughs> I got two new wine glasses. Perfect. Uh, an air compressor. Oh, for cleaning things. Apparently, yeah. I mean, I, you can use an air compressor for all sorts of things, but yeah, cleaning things, it does a phenomenal job at cleaning things. Yeah, what do, what do you have in mind for your air compressor? Just blow, yeah, basically blow things <laughs> around. <laughs> like, it brings dust into the house, blow that down or onto the patio or whatever. That's kind of the idea. Are you going to blast your uh, your computer technical gear with it? Yeah, I mean, if it has a low setting, I think you could do that for sure. Okay. okay. Awesome. Well, um, what's going on in the surf world? I've got listener line calls for you. I've got, well, Chaz Smith hates surfing, just dropped a new episode entitled, Is Felipe Toledo Pretending to Be Afraid of Chopu? The great question. I finally thought that maybe he's got a uh, little play here, that he's so not just afraid. Are these ideas for episodes coming from your own brain or are these listeners submitted? Do they come out of Beach Great comments? They, they, this one, the first couple have been a combo of my brain and Derek's brain. So a half a brain between us. Got it. Yeah. Um, it never crossed my mind that Felipe Toledo would be afraid or pretending to be afraid. And so you caught me with the clickbait. What's the backstory here? I mean, I'm just wondering, kid has... Cat like re we've discussed all of it, right? Oh, I see. Philippe has every tool in his shed to conquer that thing. No problem. It should be no problem. And then you watch, for example, whatever, uh Moana Jones. I mean Jones Moana. Moana Jones Wong. That's Correct. the one. Uh <laughs> you watch her like absolutely shredding both at Chopu, but also, you know, the recently wrapped Pipe Masters way, way gnarlier than Philippe does. So you got to think, okay, Philippe, he can't just be chicken. There's got to be a play here. Like, and I was thinking how great it would be one of the best sports movies ever. How good are sports movies from Rocky to Rocky to... <laughs> 
to um, Field of Dreams, to whatever, right? Sports movies are a classic genre. Olympic sports movies are its own classic genre. We got Cool Runnings. We've got Miracle on Ice. We got, or whatever that one was called. Is that one just called Miracle? The movie? I think it whatever. was, yeah. Uh, but a, an Olympic sports movie, we have the Tanya Harding movie. All of these classics, right? What if Philippe has roped everyone into thinking he's afraid? He's going to go out and slay Chopu and then imagine the movie. There would be no movie if he always surfed it well, but this guy who conquered his fear in movie because he was never really scared and it, went and boom, Philippe Toledo. Yeah, really interesting. I mean, yep. the idea of falsifying your narrative arc for your career or at least, yeah, I mean, it is falsifying, but at least thinking that far in advance to map it out because- in the case of, uh, let's say, Gabriel Medina, he came out so dominant yep. that there was nowhere to go beyond that. No. And, and he and we all saw it like there was you need to keep the judges guessing. And what his narrative arc became was uh, get caught up in the fame, get married, get dismantled by himself, essentially, like he dethroned himself just through that marriage and the chaos of that went away for a little while, had to come back, revitalized. John John came out with such preternatural talent and dominated. He then, his Achilles heel was Zeke Lau paddling around him, finding <laughs> finding competitive kind of uh, limitations to John John. Talent isn't enough. You have to also have the competition. So John John had to regroup, get the competitive savvy, and then come back and have round two. And so Felipe knew he needed to have a second chapter in his career and it was going to be overcoming this fear, this very natural fear that everybody could relate to. I mean, that's what I'm saying. And you cannot have just a flat arc, right? I mean, or a flat arc where Philippe, I mean, where Gabe's John Johns, these guys, they had a, you know, whatever. It's a flat arc with like a divot in it, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Philippe has the whole hero's journey baked into his. I mean, this is what people want to see. They want to see him out there like Rocky training, you know, and of course the movie, he knows, he knows his character has to be scared. So he's played scared so far. Uh, he's got to be looking at it. He's got to have those early heats where he refuses to paddle and then dun, 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 dun. He's out there running around the island. You know, he finds his Raymana character to help train him in the art of growing a spine, Olympics, the, oh, the spotlight is on, there he goes, drops into a beast, blows out, boom, Academy Award winning. I see, I wanna believe that this is true and this is what's gonna happen, but I think if it were that he would have to be um, playing into that narrative a little bit more by showing the training and like out at Chopu right now, working on it and doing the beach runs that you're talking about. But we got to get this in the movie. He knows that if we see a sneak preview of this happening, that we're not going to buy the ticket. He, We need to buy the ticket, right? So he's just going to continue to shudder in his home, like looking out the blinds, scared, feeling his knees quaking, and yeah. then drop in. So you know what's interesting too to think about is um, that f innate fear is the most difficult thing to overcome in human psychology because you're right he has every physical capability required to do the thing and far less capable people no offense but moana not as talented of a surfer is doing the thing and it's strictly somewhere in the recesses of his brain there is a fear that he has not figured out how to unlock or overcome. Yep. And it's weird. I mean, it's because it is purely mental. He has the best boards, right? Yeah, or yeah. access to the best boards. He has, I mean, nobody but nobody there has the reflexes. Nobody on tour has the reflexes of Philippe, right? right? I mean, right. He, he is like a kitty cat out there. You think he could drop airdrop in. A, nobody spent as much time in the air as Philippe. Like he could right. airdrop into yeah. one of those catch rail like figure out tweak tweak fast muscle muscle twitch and get in the perfect position and blown up it's not like the kid doesn't know how to get barrel or something
No, you're right. I mean, that's an interesting concept too. He's the best at being weightless. Yeah. So to paddle into a position where it actually was pitching him, in theory, he could do a 360 and land at the bottom of the wave and connect into the barrel at that point. Exactly. Engage the fins and off he goes. Yeah. There is no reason. There is no reason. And so this is the only reason I think is Olympic glory and the Philippe Toledo. The only thing we got to do is figure out what the name of the movie is, what it's going to yeah. be called. Yeah. Oh, well, let's work on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, miracle. And I don't know. Yeah. Toledo yeah. could be worked into it because yeah. that, that Holy Toledo, be, something like that. Something. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. We, I think he's used to that a couple of times already, yeah. but a um, uh, little feedback on your blog. Terrible wine glass. Yeah. Oh, that which was one a, did I use? Oh, like, like a, a goblet that yeah, you would have used in the one. medieval times or yeah, something. Yep. Yeah. I can't remember where those came from. I just grabbed last minute. I was trying to mix up the drink per episode yeah um and so yeah that was a that was a i didn't actually have something so when quickly grabbed whatever out of the fridge and whatever off the shelf it fit with the aesthetic of the set and your suit and all that kind of stuff but uh um, was in terms right. of function not a great yeah. functional glass no, no. also also from the comment section on chas smith hates surfing quote i wonder how many thousands of people turn this off as soon as he introduces himself and says, I hate surfing. Seems like a really bad name for a show and an even worse way to introduce yourself to anyone who doesn't have a clue who you are. Silly. Yeah, man. Sorry about it. So I'm not a YouTuber. I'm learning. How, I'm learning. I should have thought twice and should have said Chasmid loves surfing, but now I'm stuck with this. We're three episodes in another one coming up today. When you see stuff like that, do you, like, how did that person end up on this page and go through the effort of leaving that comment? Of commenting. I mean, like, did they just randomly come across the video? I don't think so, because I think YouTube, I've what I've heard, YouTube is not good for discovery. And mm. so I think it's hard to discover. Like when you go to YouTube, you're not just like scrolling, right? You know, you're going for a reason and you yeah. might get served something, but it's not like a, uh, what, a Instagram or TikTok, or whatever, where you're scrolling and random things can get in there. So this guy was going there somehow, man, maybe his friend told him about it. Who knows? But yeah, I've, like, so the fact that surfing is in the title of your episodes, he probably searches other surfing things and then that, so it fed him your surfing thing. But again, to be that unaware and then to have the, I don't know, time and interest to leave a comment on something is yeah. hilarious to me. Like, and it was real, like the uh, comment that he left was not necessarily, I mean, it was clearly negative, but it was also like, hey man, I'm going to give you some constructive feedback here. Right. Like this title is going to turn a lot of people off. You're looking for surfing people, but you're saying you hate surfing. Now let's workshop that. <laughs> what else could you say? <laughs> also to be so unaware that you think that somebody accidentally named a show I hate surfing <laughs> and they want to attract surfers and that you're, you know what I mean? It's like, how do you not understand satire at all? I mean, zero, but that's, I wonder if the general and no poking fun of this kind person, but like the amount of basic illiteracy, like people can read words, yes, but nobody's ever read anything anymore, right? Like they've not read Shakespeare, they haven't read anything so everything is just imagine living in a world where everything is straightforward where if you say something that's what you mean there's no like playing with any kind of narrative it's just no nope. oh you said you hate surfing so like hey man it's not cool to do a show about surfing if you hate it you should not hate it yeah yeah it's not a great way to introduce yourself Definitely. people are going to tune out yeah. um <laughs> Really funny. Okay, well, hey, true grit or clickbait stuff. Quote, surf fans abandoned as rudderless World Surf League heads into the new year without a CEO, exclamation point. 100% true. I mean, it has been months, months. It's a big, it, it's a big story. It, it felt like, you know, in feels like Elo was just here. Elo was such a dominant force and figure in all of our lives that it doesn't feel like he is that long past, right? That he, yeah, that he has been deceased for the six or seven months that he has been, right? Mm -hmm. So that so the World Surf League fires its CEO in a terse one sentence thing. Uh, Ella 
elevates, I guess, the head of PR and the head of legal to be co-CEOs. And there they operate to this day. I haven't seen, you know, it doesn't seem like there's even an attempt to replace the CEO, which leads me to a lot of questions, right? Is A, are they trying to get people and people are looking at the job saying, absolutely not. Like this is a total junk show, not going to do it. Not going to stake my reputation on this clown show. Or B, are they not looking for one? Are they thinking, hey, we need to pinch our pennies. Uh, times are tight. You guys are doing great double duty as PR and as legal and kind of, you know, running the thing. The thing doesn't need to be really run anyway. So let's just save our money, which if you're saving money by not having a CEO, that seems like you're doomed. And if yeah. nobody wants the job, uh, that also seems like you're doomed, right? It feels like... Uh, it does not feel like a good look for a major, well, not that they're major, but the claim to be a major sporting body to be without leadership for now seven months. I think it's the ultimate uh, unintentional reveal of what's really going on in the organization. And that is that they don't want to allow somebody to come in with direction and radically try to create, you know, reinvent the wheel. Because that's what would be required to find profitability. You know, there's yeah. no way that they're going to incrementally adjust the product and go from losing $20 million a year, whatever the number is now, to then earning yeah. million, tens of millions of dollars a year. So there needs to be a radical shift. And it's very evident from everybody that we know that have worked there and decisions that they've made that Dirk Ziff is not going to release those reins. They're clearly servicing an ideology and messaging, and they want this megaphone to do that. And so having somebody radically shift the entire product and business model will jeopardize that initial goal. So they just want somebody to come in, which by the way, they've had for the last six months to just operationally continue the thing. Right. right. Yeah. But that will never, that will also not allow them to use their megaphone because fewer and fewer and fewer people are listening. So I think the predicament that they're in, so that is the ultimate kind of unintentional reveal that has now transpired. And the predicament that they're going to find themselves in with filling that role is any CEO who's worth their you know, salary would not take this job if because they would do their due diligence and figure that out, that this is ultimately this role requires you to be a windsock. And we're going to just blow into you whichever way we want. Your hands are going to be tied. We're not going to allow you to actually make any decisions, but we do need you to receive all the crap that people are going to give you, which yeah. is what Elo, Elo did so well with a smile and a sequenced jacket, yep. you know? He really so did. he did it great. And so who are they going to get to fill that role? And nobody is going, they'd have to find somebody who's unemployed. Nobody's going to leave a lucrative job. And nobody also is going to leapfrog into a position that they're ultimately going to fail at with that because they want to use it as an opportunity to then climb a corporate ladder and then take a better job in three to five years from now. So I mean, you, you would think that there would be somebody, you know, like in the latest of the surf industry apocalypse, you'd think there would be somebody who has worked in surf industry stuff, you know, in the C-suite somewhere who could step in and say, hey, man, I'm I don't need to make a big change here. I'll be a, I'll be your warm body. I just need a job. I mean, I would somebody like me who doesn't make a great salary, and they go, "Hey, we're going to give you this great salary. It's going to defile your name and reputation." I'd be yeah. like, "I could use that salary. Sweet. I don't mind. Yeah. I will trust me. I will pick myself up by my bootstraps when I get kicked out of this place in three years from now because I've made a decent living, and I will. I'm entrepreneur." entrepreneurial enough to where I don't need to go be a CEO somewhere else. I'll just do something on my own after the fact with the cash that I made here. You yeah. know what I mean? But that's not going to look good for them to hire some no-name guy, you know? I mean, it's just, it is weird to me, like seven months is a long time and you're almost to the start of your new season without a CEO. And frankly, without any messaging around, you know, they released the Challenger series update, which was as boring as paint drying. And then that's been it. It's been crickets, right? Like I haven't seen any, I haven't gotten any WSL. Hey, one month away from the start of our season, start getting excited. There's been no, I mean, what? They just kicked uh, 
uh, Florence Marine X and um, Visla. Visla to the curb over over Lexus. Did you see that those posters? So okay, I have a question. Yeah. Yes, I saw the posters. My thought was that they didn't kick Florence and Visla out. That Vo Florence and Visla are still like quote outfitters of the event. Did you see and that? Lexus you see is the title sponsor? I mean, I get that, but did you see? I looked at the poster and couldn't. I didn't, maybe I didn't look closely enough. I didn't see Visla or Florence Marine X on their poster. They are not, and I don't think that the WSL ever uh, made a poster with them. I think that Florence Marine X and Visla made that graphic to announce the partnership, but WSL never created their own graphic with that, that logo on. I don't. Is, I don't. Ooh, this know. is a real Agatha Christie right here. <laughs> I mean, we know people at these, we know the people who run these brands, we should have asked them before going to air. But I feel that they were like, there's a lot of contests that have their like, you know, supporting sponsors like Lexus, okay, is the title True. sponsor. True. But then Florence and Visla would be, you know, underneath, of course, like in the positioning, but still on the poster. The fact that yeah. they were not there on that WSL official release felt like whoa i mean well, it felt personal whether or not they are involved it felt like they steamrolled uh florence and visla for sure yeah. because that's what and that's what the comment section said like 80 percent of it was people going what the hell happened to florence and visla basically um so yeah i think if they are still involved they could have absolutely included them and they should include them in the poster as well but man they are proud to have lexus I mean, they sure. What do you think Lexus came in swinging? I have no idea, but will Lexus be there next year is the other question. Heck no, absolutely <laughs> not. Derek wrote a funny, uh, did you read Derek's intro to it? No. Derek basically wrote about how Lexus is a beautiful car, but it is in absolutely not one of the World Surf League's uh, identified kind of groups that they're going after. It's yeah. not cars for them. No. Um, the real story here, though, that you guys did kind of write is if they did take Florence and Visla's, you know, contract and maybe even money and then got a bigger sponsor and they kicked them to the curb for bigger and better, like that would be unbelievable. I mean, th that to me is has to be unbelievable, though. There's no way that. Because they would, unless Visla and Florence said, no, we were going to be presenting sponsor and we're not going to, I mean, I guess it totally is possible that Visla and Florence said, no, you, you guys gave us this event, the pro pipeline. We said, yes, we pooled our resources. We did it. We announced it. And now you went and got a bigger fish. And so, no, we don't want to be co-presenting sponsor. We, we got it to be presenting sponsor. So the reason why I think that they're still involved is um, when they announced it initially, the wording was very specific and, and it said something to the effect of we'll be outfitting everybody at the event. Okay. Hmm. So it, uh, I think that there's still room for that while WSL can still have the presenting sponsor of Lexus Pipe Pro presented by Yeti, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is no Florence. There is no Marine. And there is no Vislo. Well, the funny thing is the WSL is so dumb that they don't realize it gives them more credibility to have Florence and Visla as their sponsors. I mean, you, you know, just... like Visla's, I mean, um, Lexus, take the money, put it on the poster, but nobody cares. Yeah. No, it's just, a, I mean, Lexus, in terms of your surf fan base, is just another word that's up there. Yeah. At least I'll give them and credit where credit's due. Lexus is not embarrassing, like Great Wall Motors or like, you know, I mean, the, the World Surf League has rolled out a bunch of embarrassing sponsors, things that are, yeah, there's no other way to put them, but embarrassing. Uh, Lexus is not embarrassing. To see the Lexus Pro Pipeline makes right. it seem even closer to the wannabe tennis tour that it is. Remember when um, they were so proud of their Apple partnership and they oh, yeah. 
The watches were not functioning from event one. Pro surfers, Leonardo Fioravanti, Kelly Slater himself, were commenting in their post interviews about how the watches were not functioning. And then suddenly, we just stopped hearing about the watches midway through the season. It, how how the, are they going to botch the Lexus one and offend the sponsor in this this year? I mean, I think I I think they need uh, Lexus to sign on for the whole year to properly blow it uh to make some bad critical comments about have like i mean it'd be like if leonardo fioravante got out of the water after this is what should happen after his pro pipeline heat and say man you know i'll tell you what i'll tell you who does luxury well italy italy does luxury cars italy does luxury handbags italy does luxury clothes i'll tell you who does like economical things well as the japanese uh likes us huh luxury japanese car yeah well, 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 I mean, man. yeah well we'll see we'll leave it to them i don't think we can be as creative as they can when it comes to botching things yep I'm um, excited. article number two of true grit quote surf city usa huntington beach cancels black history month exclamation point it did david lee scale your home old hometown your what? birthplace of huntington beach canceled black history month and women's history month and Pride Month, and all of them. Okay, what's the story? I mean, where do you, I guess if you're going to do that, where do you stop? Do you cancel Valentine's Day? Do you cancel President's Day? Nope, I think anything with identity attached to it, they canceled. So any of the, uh, you know, all of those are gone, all the months are gone, and they are going to replace them with uh, important events in Huntington Beach history, which I think we can submit things uh, which I think we probably should, and our listeners certainly should. But one of them that they talked about that was up for discussion was uh, bl the Black Gold Jubilee, where they were going to celebrate the discovery of oil offshore of Huntington. So the Black wow. Gold Jubilee is going to be a, a fun, you know, we can all show up in Huntington for that. But I feel there's so many surf adjacent uh, jubilees that we should add to the mix. Riots. I added one, I added one about the celebrating uh, Kanoa Igarashi as a traitor. And all the townspeople, you like make paper mache Kanoa Igarashis in your home if you live in Huntington, and you drag them out to the street by the neck, and everybody parades down Main Street dragging their Kanoas, and then you throw them in a pile at the end, bash them with sticks, and burn the pile. Well, consider, I mean, that's right in line with the patriotism yep. theme that they are fostering with canceling everything else. Yep, Kanoa so Igarashi was born and raised in Huntington, yet he searched for Japan and lives in Portugal traitor and everybody just goes and celebrates um uh, you might be mistaken about him being born in huntington are you sure no i'm not was he born in japan i think he was born in japan mm. but we'll have to fact check this one we'll we get, the produ get the producers on that yeah um so what is the official story here how do they is just like the city council got together and s made an announcement yep. that city council got together and said, we are canceling everything and we're going to replace them. And then the dissenting members of the city council, there was not enough of them. So this passed, uh, but the dissenting members said, this feels like a fourth grade school project where you got to figure out the black gold jubilees that you're going to replace these day, these months with. Um, I like in theory, <laughs> I'm really <laughs> be careful with how I word this. Things are getting out of control with mo things that we celebrate. You know yeah. what I mean? And every year there are new ones that you could see somebody's trying to make it stick where it's just like, I don't even know what they are at this point, but I hear a few, national pizza day or national donut yeah. day or whatever it is. And I'm just like, look, dude, I Come love on, donuts as much as the next guy. We don't need the day. We don't no. need the national day. No, some Grom, I by the way, some Grom, I'm watching the couch surfing show still, just got the wave of the day. Oh, no stickers out. on it. No stickers on his board. I don't know who it is. I couldn't identify him, but he just got an absolute slab. Yeah, man, those so, kids. The, the, the ones, the California surfers, I love that, you know, we talk about the adult learner explosion. California, you know, everywhere I surf is at least twice as crowded now that as than it was 10 years ago. Uh, the one thing that regulates though is a giant swell event where you'll have like now five guys in the water, the five guys who actually sort of belong in the water and that's it. Totally. Yeah. I got it. I love that. And for that exact reason, I stay out of the water on those days because yes. <laughs> I know it. my own limits. Have at it boys. Um, well, back, back to the calendar. 
So I do get miffed, but when I see all these unnecessary ones and I'm glad to see them not return next year, yep. but you know, there's also, um, relevance to supporting important historical events that have shaped our country. Well, and I think that let's be honest, like, I think that whether you like it or not, pride has been baked in, uh, Pride Month, uh, Women's History Month, and Black History Month. All of these have been baked in for a, a while now, right? These aren't like kind of fresh ones where, and somebody on the city council asks, why do we need to cancel these? Why can't we just add our Black Gold Jubilee or whatever? Why do we right. need to cancel them? Uh, but no, apparently the important people in Huntington Beach decided we are canceling. I'll tell you what Huntington is really doing with all this kind of stuff, which is strange to me. Uh, you would have thought, you know, we have uh, Olympics after Paris coming up 2028 in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And the surfing, I would imagine the surfing part of the games would have either been Huntington or Lowers. And now I think it's obviously only going to be Lowers. Like the city of Los Angeles is not going to touch the toxic, toxic politicization of Huntington Beach, which yeah. you'd think that'd be a real get for Huntington Beach of getting Olympic surfing. Yeah. Uh, Malibu would Malibu would be an option. You think? I mean, I guess so, summer. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of swell window, it would be the same as lowers. But but yeah, they would definitely not touch Huntington. The interesting thing that would we'll see transpire here or see if it transpires is what if residents do celebrate Black History Month and then they get ostracized? Arrested. What if Huntington Beach goes around and says, hey, we outlawed this. And we have rules here. We have our laws. This is forbidden jail. That would be a defining moment. Yep, Huntington. That would be peak Huntington. Huntington continues to out Huntington itself, though, I will say. It really does. Yeah. Like, I do totally get, I mean, I fully get, like you say, some things of, you know, and just identity politics in general are can be annoying, like where the only thing you identify as, you know, or what you identify, what you identify as is everything to do with your life that's all there is to you is your identity right which i get well, blah de, blah de, blah but um to cancel them and to make a real public canceling of them you're just you're just asking for the scrutiny you're getting and being fairly naive or it's like the person who i guess who comments on youtube things like where there's just is huntington beach city council says you know who gets a lot of press like florida and stuff by yeah that's fighting against woke that's what we're gonna do too that's what we're gonna do here that's gonna be cool well that is it is just a pr move i don't think there's any like they know that nobody actually celebrates black history month it's not like they're doing parades or getting together for a dinner or anything like that so they know that just making a headline is really what they want with the story yeah because yep. it's it allows them to further double down on the identity that they identify as exactly patriots huntington yeah. they, they all identify as brett simpson exactly um well i'm gonna play a listener line call that's gonna circle back um i mean i was thinking about like doing a recap show like what are the best calls of the year what are the yeah. and i think there's themes that have emerged throughout the year um breaking down cardboard boxes you know like yeah. uh where to hide your key kind of a thing and uh, I don't, I decided not to fully recap them, but I did find a call from a former listener, one of our um, well-known listeners, actually, Johnny Utah is what he went by. Right. Um, he, the reason why he went by Johnny Utah was he's the police officer. Yes. Um, and so he called in to chime in on the question about where to hide your keys. Volume up. Calling for the grit. Uh, you might calling for the grit. Uh, you might remember from my last call regarding the uh, surfing homicide detective who tried to set me up with his daughter, who was giving me free beers, and I totally missed the uh, what she was putting down. Uh, but I digress. That is not what this call is about. Um, today I'm calling in response to your guys' ongoing conversation about where to hide your keys when you're surfing. Now this happens to be a topic of particular interest to me as both a surfer and a cop who has taken multiple GTA reports for unsuspecting victims while they're sitting in the lineup. Due to these two worlds colliding, I feel like I kind of have a bit of an area of expertise, and I wanted to 
echo your uh, contributor from a couple of, from last week who mentioned the dirty diaper. The dirty diaper is a great tactic, and the reason it's a great tactic is because it's pretty much being hidden in plain view. Now, I, in particular, happen to have used a dirty stock that I would roll my key in and throw into the back of my truck bed um, for years, and I've never had it fail me. And the reason I think this works is because, I'm telling you right now, tweakers tweakers are going to find your stuff. They're good at it. They know where your hidden keys are. They know how to find it in your wheel well. They know how to find your lockbox, and they're going to pry it open. Pretty hard to avoid the tweaker. They generally aren't going to go through a dirty diaper or some dirty sock because they have plenty of those on hand anyway. But what the dirty sock slash dirty diaper slash trash strewn in the back of your truck does is it works against the criminal element who are out there really just to rip your car off to go do more crime. Now, small story with this. Um, in my years since being a rookie and the last story I told, uh, I've had the particular ability to do several different assignments. And one of those assignments that I've done was I worked gangs for years. Uh, as a gang officer, my job was to monitor a particular street gang and to get to know all the members or as many members as I could, know who they were, know their probation, probation parole status, know who their baby mamas were, who their baby daddies were, um, what cars they drove, their their family, anything I could get to know about them, that was my job. And that's because we work with detectives, working on cases, identifying these guys, um, and generally speaking, just try to get guns off the street, try to eliminate some of the um, criminal element of gang, gang crimes. Now, I tell the story because this is where my surfing world, once again, found its way into my police world. One particular day when I was working gangs, I pulled in the back of this apartment complex where I knew some of my gang members like to hang out. And, of course, I, as I pull in there, I see, uh, happen to see two or three of them who I know are on probation and parole. Uh, snatch them up real quick, and two of them uh, we were looking at for an armed robbery. Uh, my partner starts making, you know, phone calls to detectives, seeing if we were good to actually take these guys in for the robbery. Oftentimes, these cases take a while to build. And I start doing my thing where I'm looking around. I want to, you know, figure out who, what's going on. I noticed that one of this guy's car there. I know his car from previous encounters. Um, and so I go over to him and I'm like, hey, man, uh, you're on parole. Your car's here. I'm going to do a parole compliance check of it where your key's at. And he says, ah, oh, I don't have my keys. I don't have my keys. And I'm like, no, dude, I know you don't live here. I've been to your house. Um, I know you you had to drive here. Where are your keys? He's like, no, I don't have my keys. I don't know what you're talking about. So now I'm thinking, okay, there's probably something more going on with this car. And I got to find these keys. So I start looking. And I'm searching this car this carport for, for anything. I'm like, dude, what is going on? Did he throw them? What happened? Everything else. And I, after probably 15 minutes of looking around, I – Get down on my hands and knees. I look under his car, and amongst all the other trash, I see a balled-up sock, what looks like a dirty sock. And in this moment, I'm like, there's no way. I know where I hide my keys when I go surfing. There's no way this gangster just did the same thing. But what do I do? I crawl under the car. I unroll the sock. And lo and behold, whose car keys are wrapped up in that sock? I open up the car, do a nice pro compliance check, find an AR pistol in the back seat, and get a gun off the street. These are those times I'm like, how the heck did surfing apply to being a gang cop? But it did in that particular case. So that's my advice. Use the dirty sock. Use the dirty diaper. Um, to answer your other questions, you asked about tweakers. Tweakers are still all on meth. Meth and, and crack are still pretty much the drugs we see out there. Um, tweakers are tweaking off meth. Base heads are based out because of cocaine base. Uh, and all the other ones are on heroin. They're probably just the ones that are sleeping on the knot in your in your alley. That, that's the other side of things. But tweakers, yeah, you, it's just meth. All right, y'all. Keep up the good work uh, and buy cool deals. Surfing gets a gun off the street. I love our Johnny Utah. When he started to talk about how he was getting he need, for a job, he needed to get to know these guys and things like that. I was just waiting for, you know, they they robbed banks and stuff. And then, <laughs> you know, they wore masks like dead presidents. And then, but yeah, like, well, their leader was really, you know, he was like, charismatic but you know kind of troubled too the, the people really kind of you know worshipped him his name was yeah. Bodie or something yeah yeah and there's there's no crime happening during this big swell event the last couple of days yep no that's so we I, we try I, we figured it out and somehow being a surfer helped me it's a great story though and it's a uh, wonderful story yeah you never would have thought that surfing would intersect with uh getting guns off the street from gang members in such a way 
Johnny Utah is a good storyteller. I love the listener line callers who are like proper storytellers, right? Me Like, too. because it's not just a then this, then this, then this. Like, the story has an arc to it. Like, it, I'm listening along, enjoying the ride. Yeah, completely. Well, um, we do have an official solve for this question about what is the best way to hide your key and not get it stolen. A bunch of people had chimed in previously. I don't know if I closed the loop on it, but about how the lockbox that I was using uh, does not work or it's not foolproof because tweakers know how to open those, first of all. And secondly, they have that extender mechanism that can extend the signal from you know the front of your car all the way to the doors or beyond. So don't use that. You might get it stolen. Um, so this listener calls in from South Africa with a solution. This call came in a couple months ago. I implemented his solution and I've been using it ever since. And I've got to say, it is the foolproof way. Little thing you did wrong. Uh- Oops. Hello, guys. Uh- uh, oh, sorry, Chaz, David, background. I'm going to turn you down in the background. Greetings from north coast of KZN, South Africa, as you can hear by my brew accent. Uh, greetings, guys. Um, Chaz, thank you. I'm still getting lovely delights from your mention on the podcast a couple of years ago. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. But I'm listening to your podcast now about this lockbox story, and I come from South Africa so I know a thing or two about crime Um, also I have had I'm 48 years old I have had a total of seven maybe eight cars stolen I've had cars stolen at the beach I've been hijacked while coming out surfing two cars stolen at the beach come to think of it lock boxes total total waste of time Um, the guy if the guys here know how to break open a lock box more sophisticated criminals your side will know how to break open a lockbox. Don't do it, don't get the lockbox. Very dangerous. Uh, also, yeah, don't lie to insurance companies. I've done that and yeah, uh, still still fighting that fight. So Chaz, you're right. The insurance adjusters, assessors are as bad as lawyers. They're dangerous, they're snakes. But there's a simple solution, guys. Um, it's a little plastic surf key bag uh, that's got a double row of magnets I don't know the name I bought it at a local surf shop here it's incredible it is totally airtight Uh, it fits your key fob comes with a nice little string you tie it onto your wetsuit or your boardies in summer and you surf with your key the insurance company accepts it because you have your key with you at all times they can't ex- the, the the guys with the relay machines can't do it they can't do the relay thing so yeah it's um it's the only solution it is the only solution i've tried everything and i've failed seven or eight times hence the seven or eight vehicles anyway boys keep up work so he sent me a photo of the little baggie and it did have the brand name on it it's called fidlock f-i-d-l-o-c Fidlock. And I went I like on- it. Fidlock. And I went on Amazon and I found it. Um, I think it shipped from a different country. Like it didn't come overnight like other Amazon purchases. So it took a week or two, but he's not kidding. The thing is watertight. It's just magnets and it's incredible. Wow. Well, look at that. I mean, solving problems day in and day out, David Lee Scales is what we do. And this is not an advertisement for Fidlock, but for anybody who's dealing with this, this is the ultimate solution. Well, that's just great delivered straight from South Africa. Um, Chaz, as we wrap up 2023, do you have any reflections or reminisces and do you have any thoughts and predictions for 2024? Yeah, the uh, 2023 was a great year, David Lee Scales, I think. It was a fun year in surf. We had a lot of stories and sub stories. I think the World Surf League, of course, a gift that keeps on giving as something to talk about. Uh, alongside some amazing performances throughout the year. Um, But unfortunately, David Lee Scales, my prediction for 2024 is that the World Surf League is actually going to finally fold. This this is going to be it. There's going to, I predict, even though I think when Stab uh, did their Carissa's off tour, 
rumor. I think that mm -hmm. was unfounded and I don't think altogether correct, but I think there might be some truth in it as in she's not going to do all the events, right? I think we're going to see John John kind of not do all the events. I think we're going to see less importance placed. And if you looked at that stab uh, surfers of the year thing, who was the surfer of the year? Nathan Florence, right? No, they haven't announced it yet. They um, ask a bunch of different professionals, I think maybe 50 different professionals. And what they're doing now is re revealing those at five at a time. And at the end of the 50, they'll tabulate all scores and reveal who okay. is the surfer. So I, so I suppose it could be a WSL surfer, but a lot of surfers on that list are not yeah. even World Surf League surfers, right? I think the, the, what the World Surf League has done is diminish the product in such a way. And then also we have the rise of people able to broadcast themselves, the vlogs and all this kind of stuff. So then just the need for, you know, back in the ASP days, uh, professional surfing was really the only way to engage with surfing on a week to week or month to month or whatever basis, right? Like people would drop their video or their movies. Sure. But that would take, you know, a year or what many months at least between projects where, so to have a steady diet, of pro surfing. And then I think the ASP doing the dream tour and all that they did, they got all the best surfers in the world were on the dream tour and they were doing it because it was the dream tour for a couple of years. Right. I think yeah. what we've seen happen now ending in trestles, like the dream, that dream is dead. Uh, I feel they're going to struggle more and more and more for even basic relevancy. Uh, and I don't know how it actually folds, but I think that there's going to be a, Something is going, something major is going to happen with the World Surf League in 2024. The cliff that we have kind of been inevitably headed towards will end up being 2024. Yes. And I think, I mean, it just feels that way. It feels that way with the lack of uh, CEO, the yeah. <laughs> like move to the veterinarian offices in El Segundo. It seems like they're tightening the belt as much as they can. And, you know, I would imagine, and maybe it doesn't fold, maybe Ziff unloads it on somebody, just like he bought it basically for free, like to take over the debt. And then it's, you know, run by someone else. And, but, but the big dream, I will say that Ziff had when he, when he bought it, right. When we're going to make this the Paul speakers, we're going to make this bigger than the NFL basically. Uh, obviously has not come to fruition. And I would imagine that the appetite for continuing to kind of cut cost while delivering a worse product is is going to eventually go away. The um, using the surfer of the year metric is, I think, very telling. And there were a lot of times where the surfer poll from Surfer Magazine back in the day was uh, it's a popularity contest, obviously, but eight out of ten of those surfers, if not ten out of ten of those surfers, were, were ASP, ASP yeah. professional competitors. And I did make a note of this last year, and I think even the year before, that that had shifted to where it was like seven out of 10 last year from the Stab Magazine poll were not CT surfers. Yes. Torn Martin made the list last year. Mikey February was on the list last year, who you, he was on the CT previously, you know, but yeah. he wasn't on the year that he made it. Um, And so this year, what I've been surprised to see on that list, just kind of as a side note, is how many people picked Harry Bryant as the number one surfer. Yeah, like which Harry Bryant, I think, uh, is a real good sort of the antidote to yeah. uh, to World Surfing League surfing. He has a personality. Yeah. He's out there charging. Uh, he's like he seems like everything that the everything that surfing should be that the World Surf League is not. Harry and now Bryant. he is now he has a world of famous girlfriend. Who's that? You don't know? No. I think he went. I think he, oh, I didn't see it myself, but I was told that he went Instagram official with none other than none other than Coco Ho. No. Yeah, Coco and has. Wow. So she's wasn't she dating a pro snowboarder? Yeah, Mark McMorris, but they broke up a while back. So Got it. yeah. Harry I, Bryan and Coco. Surf now that you royalty. say that, now that you say it, I saw on a recent post of his that she had put some heart emojis in the comment. And I just, it's weird that my brain even cataloged it, but I just figured it was like they're friends. You know, I didn't think anything beyond that. So maybe my brain was onto something when it cataloged it. But imagine, imagine that though. So not only are you Harry Bryant, not only are you topping many surfers' favorite surfer lists, not only are you out charging, getting waves of the day at Pipeline. 
Now you are intertwining with the legendary Ho family. What if this is a, a PR campaign by both of their camps? Would be, where she's would be like, smart. Where she's like, look, he's on the up. He's released a film this year. He got that tenant pipe. And Harry's looking at Coco going, she's on the up. She's like, and she's available. Like, let's do this. Well, I mean, it would be the perfect, honest to goodness, like power move on both their parts. It would be Angelina and Brad Pitt circa whatever, Mr. No. and Mrs. Smith. Yeah, Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga right before they released that film. Exactly. Like a yeah. real power duo. It's like Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. Let's keep going. <laughs> Let's keep... <laughs> uh, you know what I was thinking when you said he's the antidote to the WSL surfers? He is the Avril Lavigne to when Britney Spears was bubblegum pop. You know yep. what I mean? Like you need that. There is a, always a cultural kind of uh rubber band snapback unnecessary unnecessary move harry bryant and so harry bryant will also be the one who sinks the world surf league i mean if imagine the magic and power that he and coco could have together yeah could be enough to blow the blow a giant hole right the the final hole in the here's world surf leagues yeah here's hoping ship. here's an an addendum to your point is i don't I would love to see the WSL actually fall off the cliff or crash into the wall, like to see some sort of an explosion. I would love to see, but to be honest, it could be argued that Eric Logan, the firing of Eric Logan was would, the explosion was, and we just didn't get to see it. Yeah. Like if that story ever gets revealed, it'll all be in hindsight, but we will identify that as the moment where it drove off the cliff, everything that they purport to be, their CEO was operating in a fashion that is in direct contrast to. Yes. And so it's the ultimate kind of like, oops. Yeah. And that's why the story can't go live. So, so if that gets revealed, fantastic. But if it doesn't hit a wall and it kind of putters to an end, I think that you, your, your way of like identifying a couple of surfers drop off there, they've lost relevance already those couple of surfers verify it by opting out of competing in a slow fashion, not an official retirement where they announce like, Hey, I'm quitting because the world surf yeah, is no. undercut. Like Carissa Moore would have to say they've undercut all of my efforts and my mathematical oh. winning of the tour. You there? Yeah. Check yes. one, two. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So Carissa Moore would have to make an official announcement and say, the reason I'm not competing this year is that the WSL has actually undercut all of my efforts. And I not only dominated the tour the last two years, I was mathematically the winner of the tour the last two years. And they created a format that then gave somebody else the championship. I will no longer participate in this. Yeah. That's what she would have to say. She's too dignified. She will not say it. And so if she competes in a couple of events and quietly, you know, goes away, John John competes in a couple of events. Kelly, he will continue. Even if he doesn't requalify, he'll be gifted wild cards into the, the event. So we'll continue to see him a little bit. But what all of this, my addendum to you is, what all of this does is it frees up those surfers to now be available to go surf somewhere else and even surf another event. So somebody like Red Bull can come in and just say, Hey, we're going to do a specialty event. Gabe's available. Kelly's available. John John's available. Let's really add in. Out. Yeah. Let's add in Nathan Florence. Let's add in. I mean, almost in the way that the vault, the um, the pipe masters has begun to kind of formulate. You know, where it's like these are the best surfers in the world at these type of waves. Let's just put them here. But they could do it at. I mean, maybe Vans ends up doing it instead of Red Bull. But they could do it at Candy. Dewey, they could do it at Cloudbreak, Chopu, the waves that we actually want to see. And they can also do it without any of the trappings of a legacy organization where it could just be five surfers or 10 surfers. And there's a huge prize purse and they're all just going for that in a one day event. And the thing is, I think over time uh, and more and more, this is already happening again per, you know, Harry Bryant topping lists and all this kind of stuff is the best surfer in the world now will not be on tour of you know if not this year the next year uh and so if the surf community is is in agreement that you know x non-tour surfer is the best in the world and the world surf league is still crowning philippe toledo or whatever 
then I think there's a, a, you know, the, that gap, the gap between those things doesn't bode well. Where now you're not even crowning the best surfer in the world. We're all, you know, since dream tour days, you legit did the best surfer on the world was on tour, right? It was right. Andy Irons. It was, you know, whoever was winning, whoever won the tour was the best surfer that year, inarguably. Right. I mean, yeah. I'm sure yeah. you could make some argument on some of the years, but when you won the whole season, you were the best surfer in the world. Yeah. No longer the case. No, definitely not. Interesting. Really, really hate to do this. I got to bounce in like 10, five minutes. Okay. A... that That's okay. End of the year. We'll wrap it up. Uh, let's go to commercial break so that we can get to that. And we'll close out with barrel or not. Uh, let's give some love to veyerwatches.com as we wrap up the year, just because um, not only do we just love them, but they've been with us. I was looking through the archives. I think I first started working with them in like 2018, wow. 2019. Years, years on David Lee Scales. The I'll tell you what, a lot of people out there did not get what they wanted to for Christmas. Guess what you can go do right now? Get yourself what you wanted for Christmas. And I think the 20% applies until the clock strikes midnight and uh, turns into 2024. So you still got a couple of days that you can get that 20% discount. It's beautiful. Go like... Can you put your hammer away that you got? You know, it's nice. You'll use it sometime. Get your your dust vac, you know, just put it in the garage. It'll be there. Get yourself a Veyer. Veyer watches. Veyer is spelled V-A-E-R. Assembled in America. Beautiful, really, really reasonably priced, functional, everyday pieces that will last you for a long time. And um, yeah, I just, again, in retrospect, like looking back at the year and then seeing like, man, we've been in business with them for four or five years now is That's kind great. of unbelievable. And to see them grow as a company too, to where they're getting mainstream press from all the mainstream watch kind of sites and vlogs and all that sort of stuff. And it's all favorable. It's just great to see. So veyerwatches.com. All right, Chaz, we're back from break. Um how insane is it how much John John Florence and John Daly look alike? I'll tell you who are twins. I feel that they, you know, in twins, there's two eggs that can become fertilized. And those are uh, what we call paternal twins. Or okay. Fraternal. Fraternal twins is what they're called. Then we have one egg that splits. That is a identical twin. And that is what John Daly and John Florence are. I think they're from the same egg. I think that egg, part of it went somewhere and like hung out for a minute and then got born. So they're not the same age, but they are identical twins. I think that's an excellent scientific explanation for how that <laughs> happened. <laughs> I'm no doctor, but that makes full sense to me because yeah. their doppelgangerness is just undefinable by any other measure. Yep. Undeniable. Yep. Undeniable. Uh, Jay Martinez Longtime listener, contributor, Jay Martinez chimed in uh, uh, and he asked Beryl or not about ordering the same thing as your wife This at a restaurant. This is a great question, but we have already addressed this. Jay we Martinez, have, as such a longtime no listener, I would think that you would know. Yeah. And he's like, look, I'm realizing my wife and I, we have the same taste. And so as much as I... Uh, don't you know as much as i want to eat this thing on the menu i don't want to order because she ordered i'd rather have two things and that is the solution you always pick the second thing even if you have to eat your second choice you pick it so you can have variety exactly do you remember drummer dave i sure do i mean in the storylines of this show and in the storylines of this year drummer dave is uh maybe one of my favorites of course i was going through some unplayed calls from a folder that i found on my computer and I didn't have it labeled very well, so I didn't know what I was going to hear. But I pushed play on it, and lo and behold, I found Drummer Dave's voice. Hold on. I got to find it. Give me a second. David Lee, Chaz, how you doing? Drummer Dave here. Hey, I got a potential barrel or not for you. Now that there's a little crispness in the morning air, and we've had a few windy days that are kind of chilly, uh, the women folk have uh, started their yearly tradition of wearing yoga pants with Ugg boots. Barrel or nah? I'm going to give it a huge barrel. So, get yeah, barrel. Blessed Drummer Dave from the great beyond. Love I found... you, Drummer Dave. <laughs> I, the, 
the file was labeled as October 20th, 2021. So drummer Dave, the dearly departed, longtime contributor peace. to the show, rest in peace, calling in with a somewhat controversial, trying to get you and I into hot water by commenting on women's um, fashions. Fashions and yeah. Do you want to I'm take going, it? I'm going no barrel, David Lee Scales. I'm going barrel and Uggs. I'm going yoga pants. I mean, even in 2021, that trend should have jumped the shark. You wear your yoga pants in yoga. You maybe, if I guess, at home, people, when this started happening, uh, oh, wait, I'm going to wear my comfy clothes out. No, 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 no. That was like a bad, bad mistake. Uh, and yes, no barrel. I'm going to, I'm going to go with you on this one. No barrel simply because it's played out. It's yeah. just like, it, there's certain things that become the totem or whatever for a certain genre. Uh, yeah. Uh, culture of people. Yep. And it's like ordering Starbucks, wearing the Ugg boots with a, you know, it's just, it is a certain thing and it needs to be, you need to dismantled do forever. And yeah, don't wear your comfy clothes out. People comfy clothes are not for out. Comfy clothes are for working out or for in. Out is for like presenting yourself in a way that is respectable. Agreed. No barrel. Thank you, drummer Dave. Um, this one is then kind of a perfect segue for what you just said. Also came from a listener, barrel or nah, wearing a t-shirt under a button down. No barrel. No barrel. Like you can wear a uh, wife beater. That's what it's meant for, right? Um, I guess if you're going to like you're sweaty or something and you're going to button your button up to the top button and, and wear your suit coat the entire time. So nobody can see the outline of the t-shirt underneath, but it's no that's the problem. Yeah. yeah. That's the problem. So the, the argument for why people do this is of course they want to soil the undershirt rather than the fancy shirt because the fancy shirt is harder to launder. So when I worked in restaurants, we had, you know, crappy, sorry, I keep turning the volume up for the listener calls and forget to turn it down. Um, working in restaurants, we had these, boxy button ups or button downs. I'm not sure what it's called. Uh, I think either works, but the boxy thing and it's like, okay, and you have to launder this stuff all the time. You wear the undershirt in that scenario. But if you're dressing up, you should have a fancy enough dress up shirt that uh, the cut and the material accentuates the male form and the undershirt then gets in the way and dumbs all of that down, right? If, if in question, go watch some James Bond movies. And the day you see James Bond with the outline, the silhouette of a t-shirt underneath his button up is the day that you can do it too. Correct. Excellent explanation. No button down, no t-shirt under the button down, full stop. No barrel. Final barrel or not for the year relates directly to New Year's, staying up until midnight. I'm going to go barrel. I'm going to go. It's that one time a year. And the person who's like, yeah, I'm, I'm in bed by 930. Like, okay, it's cool to be like old and announce your oldness all the time. But for one day a year, attempt, make a small attempt to stay up to a normal hour before you like crash. It is the so right thing to do. If it's 1030 at night and your eyes are getting heavy, are you going to force yourself to stay up to midnight just to honor what you said? Yes. I will take wow. a brisk walk around the block. I will some nice Joe dispense of breaths in, and then I will stay awake till midnight. All right. Good luck with that. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Well, happy new year. Any new year's resolutions or should we discuss that next week? Let's discuss it next week. Think long and hard about it until then. And then like, really let's enact to. them. Okay. I'll tell one or tell everybody real quickly. If the show got better midway through, it's because the AG1 kicked in. Go to drinkag1.com slash surf. Get yourself some of this fine, fine elixir that will allow you to execute any New Year's resolution that you put into place. It's true. All right. Drinkag1.com slash surf. Chas Smith, enjoy your holiday weekend with your family. I will see you at the first of the year. Wait, a whole new year, 2024. See you next year. Until then. Keep work. All right. Thank you, okay, sir. Thank you. Sorry. Chris Cote jumped the gun.